And without further ado, uh, the U.S. Government Accountability Office. So while he's doing this, is it going to work in a second? So um, uh, yeah, so U.S. Government Accountability Office, um, it says up there, or it did say, Congressional Watchdogs, that's kind of our nickname. Uh, we work for Congress. Um, I'll introduce myself pretty quickly. Uh, I'm Rebecca Bella. I work with our healthcare team, and I'll let my colleagues introduce themselves. I'm Jordan Lofgren. I work with our physical infrastructure team. And I'm Sylvia Arbelas-Ellis. I work with our financial markets and community investment team. I'm just wondering, how many of you are familiar with our reports? Oh, good. Yeah, so Tim read one, cool. and he found it useful, so I think that's why he asked <laughs> us to come. But anyway, that's great. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah, so we're going to give you an overview of like who we are, some of the work we do, kind of reports we put out, um, and then delve into uh, three examples of where we've used either big data or public data to answer some policy questions. Um, before I move on to the next slide, though, this is a picture of the GAO building in DC. We've got offices, uh, what, 11 different offices across the country, but most of our folks are at our headquarters office in DC. They go up to the hill pretty frequently, um, brief, brief the hill out, um, et cetera. So, yeah, so GAO, um, mentioned we work for Congress, uh, but importantly, we are an independent and nonpartisan agency. So we're um, a small agency within the wide world of the federal government, um, and we audit sort of across the federal government. Um, and I'll note, again, just like the nonpartisan nature of what we do. So um, we provide um, objective, reliable, often like very digestible information and analysis about federal programs um, and uh, any type of federal program, really. So we, we, we audit policy and we provide policy options to federal, to Congress. Um, on, uh, on, on any kind of federal program, federal spending. Uh, we audit federal programs themselves to kind of make sure that they're using federal funds efficiently um, and effectively. And how can we improve those types of programs? Are they doing what they're supposed to be doing? Um, uh, another note on that, we also do like financial audits and that's kind of how the agency started a long time ago, um, doing you know, like fin having CPAs go in and actually audit federal finances. Um, the head of our agency is called the Comptroller General of the United States, and so generally Comptroller General only does sort of those financial audits, but you know, our scope is much broader than that to look at you know, program, policy, et cetera. And so a lot of our work um, can, inf so we inform Congress, um, also agency heads, but oftentimes our reports will not only provide information, but provide recommendations for, for Congress and agencies. <coughs> Uh, about how they could improve their programs, use their funds better, uh, more efficiently and effectively. Um, kind of where do we get our work? Uh, I noted, you know, Congress. So 70% uh, of our work comes from requests, either from um, committees or individual members themselves. Um, we also get requests, or we actually get work through mandates written, written directly into the law. Um, so for example, the Troubled Asset Relief Program had GAO looking at uh, how those funds were being spent sort of every two years, I think the report outs were. Um, uh, health care reform, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, there was upwards of 30 mandates within, within PAPACA for GAO to look at various aspects of evaluating you know, program efficiency, um, patient access. Uh, actually, there was a report yesterday, I think, no, last week came out looking at the concentration of enrollment in um, health exchange programs. Um, and that was a mandate from PAPACA, so six years out, we're still doing work there. And so then kind of like our scope of work, this is just like a long list of different areas of work, right? Um, we divide our work into sort of 14 different, uh, we call them mission teams, um, that look at basically groups of work. Um, I work, like I mentioned, with the healthcare team, so uh, we work, look at federal programs, federal spending related to say, anywhere from VA, wait times, to Medicare financing, Medicaid, um, uh, public health preparedness, FDA, other things like that. 
Joni works with the physical infrastructure team. What kind of stuff do you guys do? Uh, our team generally covers surface transportation, aviation, mm -hmm. as well as telecommunications, the U.S. Postal Service, and then federal government holdings and how they manage their real property. And Sylvia? So I'm with the financial markets and community investment team, and we do a lot of work with the banking regulators and the uh, exchanges and capital markets in general, housing uh, programs and community investment programs. So we were kind of busy after 2008, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and all three of us have policy or public health backgrounds, um, but I will note one other team on here, Applied Research and Methods. Um, so we also have um, experts, uh, expert methodologists, economists, uh, other science, science technical experts, um, uh, as well as folks who work with big data um, and analytics, um, who do their own work, but then also assist us in developing our work um, so that we can provide the Congress with the best information possible. Um, in terms of like output, I mentioned we, we write reports. So we put out over nine, I think it was over 900 um, publications last year on the variety of topics, right? Um, but that includes sort of longer reports uh, answering policy questions, but also our teams can get called up to the Hill to provide hearing and hearings, during hearings, provide testimony on projects that we've either worked on or they might ask us like a new topic uh, in which you scramble and provide information. Um, uh, we also do um, legal reviews, et cetera. Um, so basically, if there's a federal program, it's a good chance that GAO is going to have done some work on it. Um, so you can go to our website and kind of find information, background information on either that particular topic or kind of that body of work. Um, so then I'm going to pass it over to Joni to talk about some, some more specifics. Yeah, and so um, Becky kind of gave you the scope of the work. And within the three teams that we work in, we just pulled a, a few report titles to kind of give you a sampling of, of what the reports actually look like. And so um, the title in each case kind of gives you some indication of the content of what's in there, what we looked at, and if we made a recommendation to the federal agency, what that uh, recommendation may be entailed. And so, you know, for the flood insurance report up there and the Medicaid, you can see that those are reports where we're outlining kind of options or considerations for that particular <coughs> program. Um, we have one here on FAA forecasting talking about what FAA should implement in its aviation forecasting activity. And so that's a review where we went in, we looked at what their forecasting entailed and came out with some recommendations on how they could improve that going forward. So just kind of a snapshot, but if you went to the website, you can see a whole lot of reports and, and a whole lot of different topics. Um, and just briefly, we wanted to kind of give a, an overview of some of the methods we do use to do our work. So whenever we get a request or we have a mandate in law, we always start by designing our review. So we very clearly define the scope of what we're going to look at, and then we lay out the methods, both quantitative and qualitative, we're going to use to collect and then review and analyze the information. So um, just some examples, you know, data, anal data analysis is something that we, we do often, both working with publicly available data sets as well as other agency data sets. Um, and we don't just kind of take the data and run with it. We always do a, a pretty extensive data reliability assessment for any data that we use. And when we publish the report and any findings, we include the results of that as well. Uh, we do do investigative audits. So in conjunction with some of these other methods, we have a team with some investigators that can look into allegations of fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, and we've had some interesting and some reports that are interesting that have been highlighted in the media that make use of those services. We do surveys, focus groups, and observation kind of as needed. So surveys um, will often, if there is a state administered program, survey the entire population. So the 50 states and territories to kind of get what their views are, what their challenges are, et cetera. For observation, we, we put a graph up here. Um, some interesting work we did both in 2000 and 2008. Um, and with the election coming up, it's, it's sort of relevant again. So um, on election day, GAO set analysts and auditors out into the field two polling places to see if there were any impediments to accessibility for individuals with disabilities. So both looking at the entrances to the buildings and then in the polling places themselves, looking at the voting machines to see if they were in compliance um, with law when it came to the polling place itself, and then if there were any impediments along the way. And then finally, we list interviews. So that's something that we pretty much always do. We talk to the agency officials that implement or oversee a program. We will interview also a wide array of stakeholders to get a range of views. Subject matter experts, researchers and academics, um, industry associations and others to help us collect that qualitative information. 
Um, so that's kind of like all the broad overview stuff. Um, and then we just wanted to hit on three examples of reports to kind of give you a little more of an idea of what maybe we've been asked to do and what some of the findings are. So with this first one, last year we did a report on pedestrian and cyclist safety. Um, this was a request that we got in, both asking us to look at what the trends were in fatalities and injuries involving pedestrians and cyclists, and then also kind of accompanying that with what efforts are underway at the federal government level, as well as um, at states and cities to try to improve the safety of these groups. So what we did kind of to look at the data was we took two publicly available data sources from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. Um, one that they have available is their FARS data. It's a census of all motor vehicle accidents that involve fatality in the United States. The other one is their general estimate system, or GES. Um, that is a sample of all types of motor vehicle accidents, and it's weighted to be nationally representative. So we took these two data sets, and first we just kind of looked at the change over the last 10 years. So from 2004 to 2010, we found that overall the number of fatalities went down, motor vehicle fatalities went down, but if you looked at pedestrians and cyclists, they actually represented a growing portion of um, all those fatalities. So um, pedestrians, for example, in 2004 made up just under 11% of all motor vehicle fatalities, and in 2013 they were up to 14 and a half, or about 15% of all of those fatalities. So we kind of gave the perspective of what had been happening over time, and then for 2013, which was the most recent year available, um, we tried to do some further analysis of um, the crashes with fatalities with cyclists and pedestrians um, to really give the attributes, you know, where are these crashes happening, who are they involving, um, what time of day are they happening, things like that. Um, so this is just a really quick skim of some of the data that we worked with, um, but the report also included, like I said, some information on efforts at the federal, state, and local level to try to address some of these issues. And Becky. Yeah. And I'm going to give you some information about um, a healthcare report that came out actually uh, yesterday. Um, uh, so you guys can go to the website, it'll be kind of at the top of the list if you want to see about generic drug prices and Medicare Part D. Um, this was a request, uh, also a request, similar to Joni's, Joni's report, um, looking at generics and Part D. So Medicare Part D is the outpatient prescription drug program. Um, for Medicare, which is the federal health care program for folks over 65, those with end-stage renal disease, and some folks with, um, with disabilities, um, and generic drug prices. So I want to make the distinction here about brand versus generic drug prices. Um, so brand drugs can be incredibly expensive, uh, sort of new breakthrough drugs uh, in most cases. Um, but then generic drugs, once the market exclusivity uh, and patent status for those brand name drugs expires, uh, companies can apply for, um, they have to prove the, the bioequivalence to um, that brand name drug and they can get generic drugs, drugs, they can get approved for selling generic drugs which are incredibly, a lot cheaper <laughs> than brand name drugs. Uh, something like 75 to 90 percent is the average um, price decrease when you look at brand versus generic. Uh, and so here we're looking at just generic drug prices in Part D. Uh, I want to note too that it's kind of um, important how you look at drug price. So we've seen a lot in the media recently about, about drug prices, and um, you just want to take a look at kind of how they're measuring drug price as well. Um, you can look at how much the, uh, the list price, how much they're asking, the, the company's asking for it, how much the person is supposed to pay, how much, all these different prices. And I want to get this right. For this report, we looked at the median per unit ingredient cost for all claims for the drug. So that's another way of measuring um, drug price. Um, in terms of data source, to answer the questions that we were asked about this, which is how um, prices have changed and if there have been any extraordinary price increases, uh, we used uh, data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, their prescription, uh, the prescription drug event data, um, which are um, pharmacy claims for all prescription drugs dispensed under Part D. Uh, and just kind of a caveat on this, although that Part D data is not publicly available in Medicare, I don't know, you guys have probably seen in the news that Medicare had um, a big push towards um, transparency in their data. Mm -hmm. They've actually recently published a, a lot of information about uh, provider utilization and payment data. So there, if you go to CMS's website, there's quite a bit of information in terms of, uh, of different files that you can download. Um, in addition to, the, to that Medicare data, uh, there's a bunch of Medicaid data that's, that's available, Medicaid analytic extract. 
Um, there's also other spending data, such as the national health expenditure data, which comes from CMS's Office of the Actuary, estimates of you know, like overall spending in different categories. Um, and I just want to point you guys to dnav.cms.gov, which has, uh, you know, basically you can search on every, any program at CMS and, and find out what data is publicly available for those. So getting back to the report at hand, um, what we did with the, with the claims data was develop two baskets of drugs. Um, one where we're looking at uh, a changing basket of generic drugs, that is uh, between 2010 and 2015, any drugs that were kind of uh, on the market for during that whole period, but then also that came on and off the market. And then we also looked at an established basket, so that's just drugs that were, um, had claims for the entire period. Um, and what we found was that there was a 60% decrease in drug, like overall generic drug price uh, under Part D for those, uh, that changing basket of generic drugs. So that's the solid line. And then the uh, sort of a smaller uh, decrease um, for that established basket of drugs. And so what that kind of tells us is that a lot of the price decline for generic drugs um, is related to new drugs, new generics coming on the market or going off the market. Um, but I note again, just it's going down. So drug prices overall are decreasing, uh, at least in, in Part D for those drugs that are being used in Part D. Um, and then we also looked, I mentioned, at extraordinary drug prices, which GAO defines as a, a price increase of 100 or more percent uh, over a given year. That's what we did for this report. Uh, and we found that for the basket of drugs that we were looking at is just the established basket, so those for the whole time period, uh, we found that about 300 of those had an extraordinary price increase. Um, and so what you're kind of looking at here is um, over time, those are specific drugs that had a price increase of 100 to 200 percent, all the way up to 1,000 or more percent. And so we found that while there were 300 drugs uh, with extraordinary price increases, most of them were in the 100 to 200 percent range. Uh, very few of them were 1,000 percent or more. Um, and kind of w one interesting note that I thought as well, um, even though you might have a, a, a price increase of 100, 100 to 200 percent or more, you might still be looking at very small prices. So I think hydrocortisone, for example, had a 160 percent price increase for one of these time periods, uh, and it went from like 14 cents to 50 cents per per dose of the cream, something like that. Um, that was interesting. Uh, sort of another interesting point about this is that, again. In general, generic drug prices going down, um, but of the drugs that had extraordinary dr price increases, most of them were not of the most utilized drugs, heavily utilized drugs. So um, it's an interesting, interesting report. It's out there right now. Um, if you have any interest in kind of like an overview of the drug industry as well, GAO reports are good for that, this one in particular. For this, we also looked at kind of what are the reasons behind drug price increases. We did a lot of those interviews to kind of with experts to figure out why. Um, so that, that's a healthcare example. And I have, I have the last example, so hang in there. Um, uh, I picked this example because I worked on, on one of these reports, and AIG is hopefully familiar to you from the news in, in 2008. So in September 2008, right after the fall of Lehman, uh, the government gave, provided AIG with federal assistance of over $102, $182 billion. So this... The government, so basically what GAO did is it provided a breakdown of the types of federal assistance because they took many forms. And it also, we created a bunch of uh, metrics for Congress to follow. They were risk and repayment metrics. And we reported on this through time. And so, uh, so I, I think this is, a, this, is, this is a good example of how we used a lot of publicly available information from different sources to kind of provide uh, good indicators for Congress and the public t who, were, who were concerned about uh, the federal assistance to AIG and, and see if they're the status of the assistance. So, so like I said, the, you know, the assistance took, the assistance took uh, many forms. There was a line of credit. It, Treasury bought a lot of stock on AIG. Uh, federal Reserve bought a lot of bad assets from AIG. So, um, so we explained all that. And one of these graphs is an example of the uh, repayment progress of federal assistance to AIG. And um, this is an example of a, a useful metric, I think, that um, we provided Congress. So we, in May 2012, we reported that Treasury would have had to sell its AIG common stock for at least an average share price of $29.70 to fully recover its assistance. So, um, so you know, if you see here, in uh, early 2011, Treasury owned 
92% of AIG stock. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot of stock. So um, eventually, uh, Treasury sold sold all its AIG stock at the end of 2012. Uh, but um, but again, this uh, putting these measures together implied looking at a lot of AIG securities, like SEC filings, you know, which are really big and nobody wants to do that. And um, Federal Reserve would report on what of what their involvement looked like and what their the valuation of the assets they bought, for example. And then Treasury would report on on um, the repayments to their line of credit, for example. So so it, it's I think it's a nice way to just kind of succinctly tell Congress what the what you know how the repayment looked like through time. Um, okay, so and then I, I also have the easiest slide. This is our <laughs> final slide. Uh, we just want to tell you that all our reports are available at www.gov. Uh, you can sign up to get emails with like the titles, which are often tell you a lot about what the reports about. Um, of any particular area that you like, maybe every month they'll tell you what the what the main um, reports are in that area. We're also in, on in Facebook, Twitter, other social media, um, and uh, we have podcasts on our most popular reports, and we have a blog that some people read <laughs> about the watch blog, including you, Derek. <laughs> so um, anyway, so let me stop there and open it up for questions. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I have a question about, um, could you speak to anything about what we don't know uh, in terms of uh, government accountability and, and like spending budgets and all that stuff? You know, like, I know there's certain aspects of the government that's kind of just like a black hole that we can't really dig into too much. So I mean, what, what I'll say is that um, from my experience, uh, I've been in jail for, oh my gosh, eight years, I think. Um, things that, that are interested that hit the media, like AIG assistance. Uh, we also had, I also worked on a, on a job um, on food recalls at schools after a large food recall in California of meat. And so like, if, if, it, if it has a lot of media attention, to, if there, there, sometimes a congressman, a uh, member of Congress will be interested in, in just obtaining some information on that. So, and we do have access to the, to the regulators and um, their documents. So, uh, but it, it would be up to the team to figure out how to answer that particular question. Yeah, I don't think they're restricted in what they can ask. Right. Um, I'll, I'll note too, like GAO, a very small percentage of our work comes from Comptroller General Authority. So things that we think are important We'll do work on as well. Um, so it seems like um, you know you guys you know generate a lot of work and reports and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I don't. I mean, how how often do you see actual change? <laughs> because like you know, if you go back to like the late '80s, early '90s, you see a lot of reports on like you know the alarming rate of incarceration in the United States and like the drug war is bad coming out of GAO, but like here we are, we're still there. It's a good topic, <laughs> yeah, I mean what I will say is so um, we, have a, we have a performance and accountability report just like a lot of federal agencies. And so a lot of our reports result in recommendations and one way that we measure our progress is the, the recommendations implemented. So, so that is something that we track over time and, and I believe our goal is 80% of recommendations implemented. And so that's a goal that we set and, and we very often hit. So we are trying to put those recommendations out there and then following up to see that they are implemented. Um, I, I can't say they 100% get implemented, but um, I mean that's at least something that, that we do try to track and we do try to push um, to get those things taken care of. I will say like it is interesting when you do see your stuff get implemented. Um, so like the VA wait time stuff, I love using this example, several years ago, um, we told them their data was crap, they changed the, I mean they were, the IG said it as well, but like you know, they did make changes to improve how they were collecting. If somebody wanted to get a study done or find out about something, they just call your office and suggest about the press? You would, I guess, call your congressperson and they would request. And so, I'll, <laughs> yeah. There's an office that deals with Congress. We don't, they don't let us 
there's yeah, there's a formal Congress. process where basically any member of Congress can submit a, a request letter, and we have a, a process to kind of take in all of those requests because we have limited resources and times, um, like like other agencies and other organizations, and so those get um, put into a prioritization, and we we get to that work as quickly as we can. And the re the results are excuse me, the reports that are requested through mandates are things that often have a time limit, so those are things we have to report on in a year or three years. So those also have um, kind of more of a deadline and, and prioritization then. Okay. <coughs> the question I have is about FOIA. So can journalists FOIA the GAO? So, I mean, the shorter answer is GAO is not subject to FOIA, but we follow a FOIA-like process. What's FOIA? Freedom of Information Act. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit more? I mean, I, I guess I don't really, I can't speak to the specifics of it right now. I can give you some, I mean, it is on our website kind of what that process is, um, but it, it, it's similar and it, it tries to follow the spirit of, of FOIA, but we have a different, um, the authorization in our creation is a little bit different, so we aren't subject to it directly. Like, for example, we use agency data, we would, I think, direct them to then that agency. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, we, you saw in the reports, we, we, the agency data is our primary source well, in my experience, that we use a lot of agency data, and a lot of that is public, also. But yeah. but it is on the on the website. Yeah. For the people that don't know what a FOIA is, what is a FOIA? <laughs> like I have never put in a FOIA. I can talk so. to <laughs> yeah, uh, journalists in the room. Sure. Uh, FOIA is a Freedom of Information Act request. If you go to Civic Tech One on One, we'll explain what FOIA is. Is there a question over here? Or, I, sorry, I, I thought your hand was up first. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So you mentioned uh, having to maybe push some agencies with more quality recommendations. Um, I realized that people are a lot of different agencies. How do you how do you prioritize what you push? I mean, I guess. Uh, the, sh the shorter answer to that is, um, so within our mission teams, um, the 14 teams that we have, um, we do have a process where on a regular basis we look at the, the recommendations that are open and we do um, communicate with the agency what some of the priorities are. Um, I guess I, I don't know that I can speak to any of those kind of broadly speaking, but kind of looking at um, the, the potential impact of the recommendation when it was made, if it's a program that's ongoing or not, there are different things we can take into consideration um, and, and the managers on that particular team will then communicate that to the agency and tell them what is maybe what they feel is most um, incumbent upon them to implement, yeah. But like I said, um, you know, we set the bar of what percent we want to have implemented and, and we, we generally meet that bar, so it's not like, you know, we're really struggling all the time to kind of to get there. A lot of the recommendations do get implemented. Okay. Okay. You guys are looking at data all the time. You mentioned some of the data sets that you're looking at. Just curious, are you looking at any real-time data? And if so, what are some examples? Mm -hmm. Most of our reviews are retrospective. I would say most, many, most of our reviews are retrospective. You guys ever worked with real-time? Yeah. I mean. I, I will say kind of back when the Recovery Act was ongoing, we had a mandate to review the, a mandate to report out on the progress of the Recovery Act. I believe it was every 60 days. And so in that case, we were very much in real time looking at um, uh, both obligations and expenditure data because there were a lot of um, requirements in law as to when agencies had to say what they were going to give the money to and then when it had to be spent by. So that's one example where we were both working with federal agencies as well as state agencies and other grant recipients to look at how that funding was happening in real time and whether some of those requirements to have 100% obligated by X date were gonna be met or not. So that's one example I can think of. So for, for a project, so you give the example of having to go through SEC filings, for mm -hmm. example, and that sounded really labor intensive. I'm wondering what it looks like to spin up a team for mm -hmm. one of your projects, or if that varies a lot, how quickly you can mm -hmm. do that, and. How you do that? That's a good question. So we um, we are all analysts, and typically there is an analyst in charge in a team. We have an assistant director, a director, and a managing director. So that's the smallest the team can be. There can be more analysts if we need more analysts. We uh, always have a lawyer, always have a lawyer, <laughs> and we uh, and we always have a, a methodologist. I think 
Uh, I've, often, I've, I've used economists in, in, all of my t in all of my jobs. I think you, you do transportation. I, I believe in one of your, elect one of your jobs. There, like we have specific, some sp people with very speci uh, specialty skills, like in electronic, I don't know. I don't remember. Engineering. Electrical engineering or, yeah. So, um, so it depends from that uh, applied methods and research team. We, we get uh, any specialty um, resources that we would need to answer our question. And it takes about a year to, to write a report. It takes less time than that, but oftentimes no, it, it takes, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Yeah. on average, it, it's not, they're not, we don't, they, they don't go It's fast, a very deliberate process. Yeah, there's a lot of review so that we can be fact-based. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I was wondering how stable or unstable <coughs> the funding is for the agency from year to year, and are you like sort of at the mercy of any forces beyond your control? Often? I mean, we're, we are subject to the, the appropriations process, so every year we get our budget set. Um, we are in the legislative branch, um, but in, you know, in recent years, as federal budgets have changed, we have seen decreases and, and flat. Um, kind of, I guess, similar to other federal agencies. So it's, we don't have a hard and fast money from year to year. We are subject to that process as well. Mm -hmm. Did you do any uh, work on the F-35, which is the most costly uh, military project in history? So no, that we haven't, this, the folks up here, but I'm pretty sure GAO has done. There's a, a team that looks at, at DOD uh, pretty extensively. I, I really don't think any of us can speak to it. Yeah, not so, to details, unfortunately. No. So the teams that are in the Chicago office are healthcare, uh, physical infrastructure, financial um, investment, and community, well, financial markets and community investment. And uh, we have something called education, workforce, and income security. So th those are the four teams that we have here. Um, yes, in the back. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna ask mm -hmm. the Chicago team work with the set funds at all, because the set funds right now to allow the money to go back to Chicago Public Schools so Congressman asked mm. uh, if that was doable or mm. um, can you say that again? What was the tip? Um, so, so I'm not aware of anything coming in. I mean, I guess I will just kind of add because we are at the, the federal government level, um, oftentimes there needs to be the federal, we always call it the federal hook. So kind of either what the federal oversight would be that would kind of give us a reason or what the federal funding would be. So I'm not aware that there's anything kind of directly in line there. So would a congressman, if they asked for it and were able to like sell that book, is that something you guys would be able to be like part of your purview? I mean, if, if we get a request letter in, it is then subject to going through the process of um, being prioritized and, and being accepted. So I can't, I can't speak to the specific topics or, or the timing or anything like that, yeah. Yeah, uh, I guess this is a silly question. Have you guys done an economic data analysis that compares your budget based on what articles you put out over the year? <laughs> uh, not that I'm aware of, no. That would be interesting. Yeah. Interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> I know we have a lot of analytics, but I don't know what. Sorry, oh, yeah, over here. Uh, how did you guys get into this line of work? Um, well, GAO recruits heavily at the University of Chicago. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of University of Chicago um, uh, MPP people at GAO. But I, I'm, I think I'm the only one, though, from UC. So I, don't, I, I, think, I think they do a lot of recruiting in, uh, at uni colleges. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I similarly colleges, will speak. Yeah. My experience was going, I was in public yeah. policy school, and there was a recruiting yeah. event, and that was kind of that. Yeah. We also hire from like industry, you know, like so a lot of folks on the healthcare team will have policy backgrounds, but they'll also have like industry backgrounds. The healthcare for those is expertise different. as well. <laughs> Their team is different. In the glasses. Okay, yeah. Last question. Okay. Did you contact some of your research mm -hmm. and other research institutes, or did you like mm -hmm. undertake all the investigations? Oh. Um, I, I don't think we contract out like full investigations. We might buy data if it's necessary yeah. for answering our questions. Uh, I think for like the focus groups, we might use a contractor to help us with that for like certain economic analysis. We might for specific pieces, um, but you know, we're subject to the, you know, the whole uh, contracting process, federal con contracting process in that, in that context. Yeah. Uh, cool. <laughs> Good. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.